Um, so I'm Andy Sutherland, uh, uh, the University of Virginia, um, and the deputy editor for the Neurology Podcast. And I have the great pleasure today to be interviewing uh, Dr. Andy Solomon, who is assistant professor of neurology at the University of Vermont College of Medicine and the uh, chief of the Multiple Sclerosis Center at the University of Vermont. And we are going to be discussing Dr. Solomon's uh, presentation at our plenary session uh, titled The Spectrum of Multiple Sclerosis Misdiagnosis in the Era of the McDonald Criteria, a Multicenter Study. And, I'll, and I had the opportunity to attend this session and uh, as someone who uh, uh, does not practice multiple sclerosis on a daily basis, it is obvious um, that it uh, presents enlightening information that I look forward to discussing with Dr. Solomon now. So Andy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, um, so why don't we just get started, and if you will, I'll give you the opportunity to provide an overview of the nature of the, the study that you did, and, and uh, we can discuss from there. Sure. Um, trying to think where to start. So, so I think in practice, a lot of us have experienced this problem. Oh, going to be a little closer. There we go. Okay. So I think from our clinical experience as MS specialists, uh, we've, we've seen a number of patients over the years who've been misdiagnosed, you know, which got me thinking about this problem. Um, so I looked for data, and, and there really wasn't much. Uh, I think as you talk to a lot of people out in the community, in, in private practice as well as in MS centers, we all you know, face this challenge of, of making the diagnosis of MS, but we also see patients who we, who we think have been misdiagnosed or incorrectly diagnosed with MS. And uh, when I looked at the data, a lot of the data that we have uh, comes from case reports, which probably overrepresent uh, rare diseases. We all think about this broad differential diagnosis of MS. We send these panel, panel of labs for the diagnosis of MS uh, for a number of rare disorders, um, but the case reports may not really represent what we're, what we're seeing. And uh, so the, the other data we have was really from the 80s and 90s, which was before the, the MRI became incorporated in our diagnostic criteria, before it was widely available and, and used for the diagnosis of MS. So thinking about these patients was sort of the genesis of, of this research. And, and in 2012, we published this paper in neurology that was just a survey of, of MS specialists asking, you know, how frequently do you see this problem? And we found it was, it was quite frequent. You know, 95% had seen such patients over the last year. Um, but that, that sort of data from a survey was, was not, you know, there's not much you can do with that. It was just, you know, how many of these patients do you recall seeing was sort of the purpose of that initial survey. Um, so the, the purpose of, of this study, that the data that I just presented, was to uh, really collect prospective data on patients who had been misdiagnosed and, and try and understand who those patients were and, uh, you know, make some inroads into how we can prevent misdiagnosis. So tell us a little bit about the profile of these patients and what you learned about misdiagnosis. This is obviously very clinically relevant. Um, um, what were the, you know, what was the patient profile generally? And then what was the range of, of, of misdiagnoses that the group came up with? And sure. we should mention that these were, these were trained uh, specialists in neuroimmunology as part of your study that were reviewing these cases. Is right. Yeah, so I'll, t I'll talk about the methods for uh, um, briefly. So we had four MS centers, academic MS centers. So it was UVM as well as the Mayo Clinic, um, WashU, and um, OHSU. And these are all uh, academic MS centers. And we had 23 neurologists who were MS specialists who participated in this study and identified patients over the course of the study who they had evaluated as new patients who, had, who they felt had been misdiagnosed with MS. Um, and so we had this web-based database entry form where people would enter different characteristics about these patients. And, and not surprisingly, this has been our, our experience, uh, that the majority of the diagnoses that were mistaken for MS uh, were very common disorders. So things like migraine, fibromyalgia, conversion disorder, psychogenic disorders, um, as well as what may be best described as a syndrome where we have patients with sort of nonspecific symptoms, symptoms that don't localize to the CNS, they're not typical for demyelination, and have an abnormal MRI uh, that's nonspecific, um, as well as NMO. I mean, our top five, uh, NMO was number five. Um, but these were the syndromes and diagnoses that were most commonly uh, mistaken for MS. And, and migraine it was about 20% of the people in our study, migraine along with other disorders. So. And, and w regarding that, one of the things that I thought was fascinating is, th is when you actually analyzed how these individuals were diagnosed and how long they had been misdiagnosed. And, and a fair number of the folks that had made the original MS diagnosis, which turned out to be incorrect, were actually specialty trained 
neurologist with expertise in multiple sclerosis, which is, which is sort of uh, um, sobering uh, for us in practice. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's an important finding. Um, you know, we don't have a specific biomarker for MS. I, I, it, I highlighted there was a recent, uh, two recent uh, letters to the editor in New England Journal just two days ago uh, concerning a, a biomarker we were hopeful about. Um, there may not be a single highly specific biomarker for MS. So this is a clinical diagnosis, and we have to interpret MRI and, and clinical symptoms and syndromes. Um, so we make mistakes as MS specialists, a, as do non-specialists. And um, Bob Herndon wrote a paper on misdiagnosis of MS in the 80s. Um, and there was a nice quote in there, you know, and it pertained to MS specialists, actually. So we see maybe a little bit more of the, the variety of MS than people out in the community. So we see a lot of atypical cases of MS. So once you see a lot of atypical cases of MS, you may be more prone to saying, well, this is just an atypical case of MS, rather than actually reevaluating and saying, maybe this isn't MS at all. So there may be different reasons that, that MS specialists and non-MS specialists um, make mistakes, uh, but, we, but we, all, we all make mistakes. Uh, yeah. and, and one of the very clear um, issues with this um, degree of misdiagnosis is that the patients that you analyze had been on immunomodulatory therapy, some for many years, which is both costly and also has potential side effects. Yes, so uh, I think the number was uh, a third um, had been on uh, disease-modifying therapy for, for 10 years or greater. Um, a third had been diagnosed with MS incorrectly for 10 years or greater. Um, we have newer therapies that, that are coming out now that carry higher risk, uh, including PML, and uh, it's, it's a serious concern, so we really need to do our best to, to be accurate in our diagnosis. So Andy, what can we then learn from this, uh, taking it forward for both neurologists and general practice, but also MS-trained yeah. specialists like yourself regarding the clinical criteria, and then I've obviously the radiographic criteria, the reliance on MRI, I think that led to a lot of these misdiagnoses, it seems. Yeah, I think, I think um, it's important to think about our, our diagnostic criteria and how they came to be, uh, you know, the McDonald criteria. So when these criteria were developed, they, they were developed in patients who had typical syndromes or, or for demyelinating events, right? So these are patients with optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, brainstem syndromes like INO. Um, they were not patients who had sort of nonspecific tingling or numbness somewhere in an abnormal MRI. Um, so these patients had, had a high probability of developing MS. The purpose of the criteria to, were to, de to determine who was at high risk after that first event of developing MS. So uh, we have to be extra careful when we see patients with atypical syndromes, which happens quite frequently. Um, and we have to be careful when we see patients with atypical syndromes and an abnormal MRI. Um, as I highlighted, migraine, uh, migraineous lesions can, can meet dissemination in space criteria. The MRI criteria themselves, again, were meant to predict who's going to develop MS from a population of patients who had very high likelihood of developing MS to begin with. So the MRI criteria were not meant to distinguish one disorder from another. So, uh, you know, what this all means to me is that, uh, you know, if somebody has a very typical presentation of MS, um, it's, it's easier to use our diagnostic criteria, but we, we shouldn't rely too heavily on MRI um, or, or these criteria in patients where they have an atypical clinical symptom. Uh, we need to do more, and sometimes more means more time. So monitoring people and re-imaging, uh, you know, is really challenging when we worry about initiation of therapy quickly and making that diagnosis early. Um, but in many ways, you know, MS shouldn't be a default diagnosis. I like what John Corboy said is it should be like a proactive diagnosis. It's not a diagnosis where there's no better explanation and it, it, therefore it must be MS. Uh, we should be imaging the spinal cord in many patients, uh, you know, and that sometimes can be helpful. The, the, the differential for spinal cord lesions is much more narrow than, than an abnormal, nonspecific brain MRI. Uh, we should be getting CSF. CSF is no longer part of our diagnostic criteria for MS, but in patients with atypical presentations, we probably should be doing that to help us narrow it down. Um, so I think, you know, if we really strictly adhere to our diagnostic criteria and say, you know, is this, is this clinical presentation a typical presentation of MS, then I can use this criteria. But if, if it isn't, um, there's more work more work that we need to do to establish the diagnosis. And sometimes time is, is what we need and repeat imaging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Andy, I think that's a, that's a great summary and, and lesson for all of us in practice, particularly those who see patients with multiple sclerosis on a regular basis and those that ultimately may not have multiple sclerosis but, but are referred for evaluation.
uh, uh, as a as a as a practicing neurologist, I think I believe that that your study reminds us that um, our exam and our intuition is often as important as the tools that we use to confirm our diagnosis and that our clinical diagnostic reasoning uh, continues to be something that we need to hone just as much as our, as our advanced technology. So um, with that, I will thank you for your work. Um, congratulate you again on the plenary presentation and your research discussing the spectrum of a misdiagnosis and multiple sclerosis. And would like to open it up now to our audience.